Hi all. Due to uh, an unexpected scheduling conflict, and actually it's not unexpected because I was given a gift back at my birthday in February of tickets to go see Natalie Merchant Monday night, which I didn't forget about. I just didn't reconcile with the fact that it was on a Monday night. Uh, that came to me this past week when Donna and I were talking and I suddenly went, oh my gosh, that's the same night as the meeting. So while I will not be with you Monday night, because so far the show hasn't been canceled, unlike several others we've tried to go to, uh, Cam and I will be in Greenville at the Peace Center. Instead, I'm going to do what I do for some of my classes, give you a very short, hopefully, presentation on the book that I'm supposed to be covering. Hopefully, you'll have had a chance to watch this before Monday night. Um, if not, some of the others can tell you about it. And again, I'm going to try to make this pretty short so that it doesn't suck up a lot of your time, unlike what I do with my students. So here we are with the book itself, Tidewater. Uh, the logo that you see around it is from uh, Libby Hawker's publishing company, um, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute, because she does something that hopefully uh, Linda will appreciate. She's an independent author. All of her books so far have basically been done by herself, or she recently contracted with a smaller press, like uh, this one, the one that the book is with, um, Lake Union, to do her work. So, uh, But she has become quite best-selling, actually, uh, at least if you look at the Amazon stats on her and you look at uh, some of the interviews that she's had and some of the numbers to keep coming up. So I'm going to kind of go through some of those, uh, talking first of all about her, as I said. She is an independent author. She is not signed with uh, a major publishing house, and for a, to a certain extent, that's intentional. So this is a page from an interview that she did um, with, and I'm sorry, on Inspiration uh, with Elizabeth Stores. Um, that is one image of her. I actually have another one here. I think that's it. Yes, yeah, this is another image of her as well. Um, she is interesting to me particularly in that she started off uh, wanting to be a writer, uh, has a degree, if I recall correctly, in um, English. I like this particular part. Uh, she started her love of reading with Watership Down. And uh, these are many of the authors that particularly inspired her, Nabokov, Montgomery, Hilary Mantel, Joyce Carol Oates, George R. R. Martin, who is a fantasy writer. Um, all of these are people who most of us should know. I also particularly like that Leonard Cohen and Nico Case were among her major writing influences. They are two of my favorite lyric writers and songwriters as well. So while this particular book is set uh, on the with the founding of uh, the Western Hemisphere, her actual biggest interest is apparently in ancient Egypt. Um, she has several series that are set there, um, and by that I do mean series. The Pocahontas book that we're seeing here, while I, she mentions in the back of it that she's been working on a follow-up, so far that hasn't come to pass for the most part. Her bigger love, according to uh, everything that I've read in the several interviews I've read has been with particularly ancient Egypt and the ancient world. Interestingly, one of the things that uh, inspired her to write this book is that she worked for a long time in a used bookstore. And in that used bookstore, she would come across books that she found particularly interesting. And the big one for this one uh, was one that she stumbled across that gave her the idea of telling the story of the Pocahontas John Smith myth, as it were, uh, based mostly on the Native Americans themselves. This is the book that she found used, Pocahontas, Powhatan, and Opechancano, Three Indian Lives Changed by Jamestown. Um, while many of you, I'm sure, have found that it's quite... <laughs> personally found it wonderful, but I'm sure many people found that a lot of her descriptions, particularly of the Native Americans, could be tedious in places. Um, she did a tremendous amount of research on this, and using Roundtree's book is particularly good because, as it says here, from an ethno-historical perspective that looks as much to anthropology as to written records, Roundtree draws a rich portrait of Powhatan life in which the land and the, govern and the governed life in the English were seen not as heroes, 
but as Tacitus, as strangers, as invaders, and even as squatters. Um, a lot of the work that Roundtree did is in what we call ethnohistory, where she actually looked at the English writings, um, but also extracted from them the stories that uh, they had of the three main characters here of the uh, Powhatan people themselves, Powhatan himself, um, as well as Pocahontas and Pachancano, of which there are different accounts from a variety of different English people, but also from the anthropological perspective of going into uh, where we found remains of these societies, looking at what was left there, uh, looking at the descriptions that we have from what the English left of uh, how these people looked. In fact, one of the things Hawker says uh, in one of her interviews is how much the descriptions of the indigenous people appealed to her, particularly those of the Powhatan women and the fact that they were tattooed and they would dye themselves and they wore their hair uh, very much in the way that she discusses in the book. And the research that she did from that through Roundtree and through others on uh, how the native peoples viewed themselves and why they did these things and how those styles as with their names, changed at different points in their lives to demonstrate new transitions. So she put a tremendous amount of effort and research into this book. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to move on to the actual people in the book themselves. First, of course, is John Smith. Uh, this is an image of him from the National Portrait Gallery. I also have one of Pocahontas, also from the National Portrait Gallery. Um, I will include these in the links in the email so that you can see them if you wish, um, so that you'll know a little more about uh, where these come from. These are as close to accurate as we have. Um, the artists in both cases are effectively, well, the artists in uh, Pocahontas's case is unidentified, even though this particular image of her is drawn after a copy of her done by Simon Van de Passa, uh, who also is the one who did, I think, the John Smith one. Uh, yeah, Simon Van de Passa, uh, both of whom, apparently the artist met both of them. Um, in the case of John Smith, this particular image came from a flyer that uh, he commissioned to sell the company itself, the Virginia Company um, of uh, Jamestown. And we'll talk about that. I'm sorry, the London Company of Virginia, which we'll talk about in a minute, because I think that is one of the subtexts of the book that doesn't actually get brought out in the book. Again, to be fair to Hawker, she does a tremendous lot with this book, as many of you have seen by how long it is. Um, but there are a bunch of other interesting historical points to it that I'm going to go into after we get done with this. So first of all, uh, John Smith. Interestingly enough, Pretty much everything she says about John Smith in this book is accurate. This man is a fascinating uh, historical figure. He did indeed, well, here we go. I will send the link to this as well. This is from the National Park Service, who I actually love as a historical source because, um, as we in the historical profession know, if you actually want to get a job working with real history, often working for the National Park Service is one of those places. If you actually uh, search anything online historical and you find an nps.org site for it, go look at it because it's uh, been commissioned by the National Park Service and usually is written by uh, an historian, someone who is very interested in the period, often not necessarily someone who we think of as an academic historian, quite often though, someone who is a practicing historian, someone who works on the park ground, someone who works with these ideas, many of whom get their jobs because they're working for the National Park Service and they want to work specifically with this one time period or this one place. In this case, uh, this person who wrote this on John Smith uh, did a very good job um, discussing and making it not just uh, academically pedantic in talking about him, um, but in depth about how John Smith started off uh, as an Englishman. Um, as Hawker points out in the book, he was not uh, an elite part of the aristocracy. He was a commoner. He did make his way literally all the way to Constantinople um, by fighting, first of all, in the uh, wars between 
interestingly, uh, our great uh, Habsburg ruler Charles V against the Ottoman Turks. He was one of the many who volunteered to go fight in those wars. Um, I could do a whole lecture on this, and for my history classes I do, but I will spare you that here and just tell you that, yeah, pretty much everything she says about John Smith is true. Um, he does end up enslaved in Constantinople, manages to escape, uh, I love this particular part. This is a Charlotta, who uh, the woman who he uh, thinks about in the opening sequences of the book, um, the woman he was in love with. Uh, this part particularly is of interest to me. He actually escapes from his captivity and makes his way almost 11 thousand miles effectively in four years across Europe, bearing in mind that this was on horseback and walking. I mean, this is a phenomenal thing. And this is before he actually gets hired on by the London Company of England uh, to come to the Western Hemisphere. So this man is like all over the world. He truly is one of those adventuring sorts that was very prominent in this period. Um, here we go. He gets uh, basically taken into the employ of Bartholomew Gosnold, who is uh, one of the chief founders of the London Company of Virginia, who is very uh, impressed with him, which is part of how he ends up in the position that he does when he finally does make it to the Western Hemisphere, even though, as she talks about at the beginning of the book, in chains, uh, accused of leading a mutiny because he and if you think about it, why would he have any respect for aristocrats, particularly after being enslaved and mistreated by them? Um, he has no respect for the aristocrats. Uh, and that becomes a recurrent theme throughout the book. And as she talks about later in the book, how he and Pocahontas bond, is because they both realize that even though they have aspirations, because of their actual birth, they're never going to make it there. Um, some historians actually argue that the birth of what we think of today as um, classical liberalism, and by that I mean the sense of uh, individual rights versus uh, this idea of a society structured based on birth, um, comes about because of the expansion of peoples into the rest of the world and their um, dissatisfaction with the idea that how you're born can dictate uh, how you control things and what you do, uh, especially in situations like how John Smith finds himself throughout his life, not just once he gets to the Western Hemisphere, but throughout that. So anyway, Smith is very much uh, one of those first people who believes that you do work and you eat, otherwise you don't eat. And that whole little spiel that he gives uh, at that point that Hawker puts those words in his mouth, those are actually words that he was reported to have said. Um, at one point in time after he had come back and discovered that things at Jamestown had gone badly, mainly because all of these great gentlemen couldn't be bothered to do things like keep up with the, um, the foodstuffs they did have and protect them from being uh, scorched by rats. So, uh, yeah, Smith, a very, very fascinating man, um, as we find out as the book goes on. And in case there are those of you who haven't finished it, I won't divulge a lot of the endpoints, but they are all accurate, even though, as Hawker says at one point in her um, afterward, some of them are a little out of order. Um, so I won't go into that other than to say that when he does finally give that spiel and is voted in as president, um, the voting in as president had actually happened before that. Um, but she takes credit or takes um, maybe not credit, but acknowledges the fact that she did kind of switch the timeline up a little bit. But outside of that, for the most part, everything is exactly accurate, not just with Smith, but also with, as I will talk about now, Pocahontas. All right, so Pocahontas. Um, fascinating, fascinating woman. I know many of you probably got frustrated, confused by the numbers of different names she had, not only her, but pretty much all of the uh, indigenous people in the book that were leaders. Um, Matawaka is actually the name that she was mostly known for, particularly as an adult. Um, Amanuti also, another, uh, her early name. And uh, to be fair to indigenous peoples, this was not uncommon. In fact, most of the uh, indigenous peoples in the Western Hemisphere um, had new names as they made different transitions in their lives. And so a lot of what Hawker did with that was accurate for the Powhatan people, but also for most 
uh, indigenous peoples. Um, if we're talking about like many of the great Comanche people, like Crazy Horse, uh, the English translation of his name being Crazy Horse, he had multiple names throughout his life, and Crazy Horse became the last name he had uh, based on some of his antics in his wars with um, and against the U.S. military and some other things that he did. So this is not an uncommon event. It is confusing to those of us who, you know, are living in a world where we have pretty much one, maybe two names, depending on if you uh, take a different last name when you get married. Um, but even today, you know, we're still pretty much with this idea that you're born with a name and it kind of stays there. Not so much in the indigenous world. Um, most of what she talks about with Pocahontas is um, very, very accurate as well, uh, including uh, the fact, and I'm going to try to find and see if I can find this documentary, Pocahontas Behind the Myth, to share as well. I've seen it once, and it's been um, a while back. I didn't rewatch it for this, but it was very good. Um, but it does talk about, uh, first of all, the one thing that Hawker doesn't address in the book um, that has become a theory since she wrote the book in 2016, that what Pocahontas was actually doing when she rescues John Smith, uh, saves his life in theory from being killed by her father, uh, was part of a formal ritual performed by many of the indigenous peoples along um, the Atlantic shoreline um, that was an adoption ritual. Um, a lot of what she talks about in the book where Pocahontas from that point begins to uh, address John Smith as a brother or as a relative, um, that this was actually a ritual that was performed um, not just with the English, and in fact that particular moment with the English was rare. It was normally done with other indigenous peoples when you adopted them into the tribe, and this was not uh, uncommon at all as different groups moved about. And that's one of the other things in the book that might have been kind of confusing was when she talks about different groups like the Pamunkeys, um, the Appomattox. These are different peoples who are different subgroupings of people who uh, had allied themselves with the Powhatans um, and who became subsidiaries of Powhatan when they acknowledged him as their king. It's not dissimilar in European history to those different points in time where Spain or France or Germany would conquer another area where people perhaps spoke a different language, um, would bring them in, would tax them, would make them part of their national identifier. Um, this is kind of the same thing, but it's what indigenous people did consistently. And again, not just when the English arrived, but had been going on for centuries among the different indigenous peoples throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, again, similar to the way Western Europeans did it, but just um, something that is a little more complicated for us to understand. It's also part of why when Hawker gets towards the end of the book and there's uh, the kidnapping of Pocahontas, again, I won't go into the big details, I was going to say that yes, that actually did happen, that is part of how she ends up with uh, John Rolfe later, um, that as this uh, event occurs, um, part of the reason for that is not dissimilar to things that happened in medieval and early modern Europe, where uh, they would kidnap uh, different leaders of uh, different societies, uh, Richard the Lionheart kidnapped uh, on his way back from fighting the Crusades uh, and held hostage and ransomed. This was very a very common situation as well, and it's part of how people got to know each other, but also part of how affiliations broke down was when somebody betrayed somebody else in this way. All right, so yeah, the, uh, a lot of the Pocahontas stuff, very accurate point. Uh, again, you may have been overwhelmed by a lot of her descriptions, um, but I personally kind of like those as they're a demonstration of how um, they were considered to be transitional points in um, Native American lives consistently. Okay, so I've already gone on longer than I planned to with this. I was going to try to keep it at 15 minutes. I'm already at 20, but so I'm going to tie this up pretty quickly. Sorry if I'm talking too fast. Um, one of the things that she doesn't cover in the book is the Virginia Company of London. And this is part of the history that I find very fascinating. I know why she doesn't actually go into any great detail about it because it would have made this long book even longer. Um, but I will say that it is one of the motivators that we don't tend to see. Um, and that's that all of these guys who are coming over 
from uh, England, all the Toss and Tosses, as uh, the um, Powhatan people think of them, are coming as merchants. Um, Smith talks about this some, um, and she does a little bit with Smith. Um, certainly, it's a big part of why all these gentlemen are coming is because they're all investors in this company, the Virginia Company of London. Um, this is part of how, when we think of the big transition into what we'll refer to as the early modern world occurs, when we think about Europeans becoming so prevalent in particularly the Western Hemisphere, but in the world, and why we think of the West rising above pretty much everybody else economically, politically, socially in the period from 1500 to 1800. A lot of it is because of this mercantilist idea. And by that, what I mean is the creation of the joint stock company, which later goes on to become the basis of what we think of as capitalism. The idea of people pooling their money together um, to do something. This literally starts in this period. The Dutch are the first to do it. Uh, the English very quickly adopted. And in fact, the Virginia Company of London was one of the very first of what were referred to as the joint stock companies that the English invested in. Um, but it also is a big part of why these guys who come over are all gentlemen, because it's their money that they're uh, investing and they want to come see what's going on. It's also uh, a big part of how when they get here, they are so driven to do the things they do. A lot of the horrific things that Hawk talks about in the book, um, the destruction of uh, Native American villages, the kidnapping of women, the enslaving of Native Americans, that is the subtext of a lot of this. A lot of this is because these guys have invested everything they have, and it's about trying to find some way to make that money back. They came over expecting that we're going to find gold the same way that the Spanish did. Uh, this is a big part of why this starving time happens, not just with uh, what happens with James, um, with Jamestown when John Smith first comes in this first three or four years, but it, the actual worst starving time happens afterwards, and that's a big part of uh, when they make that transition, they think John Smith is dead, which he's not. He's gone back to England to recover, as she talks about later. Um, a lot of uh, our understanding of the Pocahontas mythology, a lot of what drives these men uh, in this starving time is the fact they've invested everything they have in this and they came over expecting they were going to find gold when they don't it takes them several years to begin to figure out another way to make money tobacco is going to be that way uh, that's going to be where john rolfe literally comes in because he's the guy who listens enough to the indigenous people to figure out how to make or hybridize a tobacco that europeans will smoke because their palates are very different from the tobacco that the um, indigenous people are smoking um, but it takes a while to get there and that's where the starving time comes in um, which actually is even worse after john smith leaves now a lot of the marketing however as i mentioned uh, to start with a lot of the marketing um, for this john smith is going to become very instrumental in um, but that's after he actually goes back to england after he is injured in that explosion and goes back uh, to recover. He's going to make one trip back um, after that um, due to something different. Uh, what's even more interesting and what I will try to uh, conclude with right here very quickly is that it's not just Jamestown that is a product of the Virginia Company of London, but later Plymouth is going to be uh, where the pilgrims come. This also is part of the Virginia Company of London. Uh, they actually uh, promote, create this. The pilgrims themselves, however, don't want to end up in Virginia with the um, Anglicans who are there. Uh, the, one of the things that we tend to forget is that the Mayflower itself was actually paid for um, by the Virginia Company of London. It was also uh, other investors in the Virginia Company of London who commissioned the pilgrims, the separatists, to come. The pilgrims themselves, who will remove themselves from Virginia, move up to where we think of as uh, Plymouth, which and what will later become Massachusetts, um, were trying to distance themselves physically from the London Company of Virginia and Jamestown because they did not want to be part of the Anglo construction of that colony. Um, so it's a really interesting little subtext. I'm not going to go into a lot of great detail here because it's separate from the story we're talking about, but uh, I would be interested in Hawker writing about that as well, given what a good job I thought she did with this. So I'm going to conclude with something that I think is um, 
instrumental in understanding partly why she uh, makes this book so long. Um, part of why, though, I think she does such a really, really good job with it. And this is from her own words on page 515 of Tidewater uh, in her afterward, where she talks about um, learning that the story of Pocahontas was very different from the Disney version, which is what I really love about this book, um, but also from a lot of the mythology we have. So picking up on page 551, literally the very first paragraph, the Western world has a long history of treating indigenous peoples with varying degrees of disrespect. On one end of the spectrum, they were and are treated with open hostility and racism. On the other, they are seen as morally flawless, enlightened beings noble savages who had it all right until those white guys came along and screwed up utopia. I find the latter just as inappropriate as the former because it lumps a huge variety of cultures into one generic category. It stripped from these peoples their real identities, their true heritage. It makes Native Americans of the past, like Pocahontas, into morality lessons instead of celebrating them as individuals whose lives changed the course of history and whose influence still echoes today. It places a featureless mask onto all of them, the natives of history and those living now. And I think that is the perfect summation of this book and pretty much of a lot of the complexities of trying to teach indigenous history to start with. It's because we come into it and to our colonial history, um, in fact, pretty much all of our history of the U.S., um, with these kind of black and white bipolar images of both the colonists and the indigenous people. And it's all much more complicated than that. So with that, and on that note, I will conclude. I will say that, A, I am very sorry that I will not be there Monday night. I hope you all get a chance to hear this and I haven't talked too fast and that it makes some sense. Um, I will also conclude with the fact that I absolutely love this book. And I know that many of you, <coughs> Cindy. Probably do not. Um, I'm going to give it a 4.75. And the only reason I'm not giving it a 5 is because I do agree that it is long and periodically a little repetitious. I think she does a brilliant job, though, with the history, with making this as historically accurate as I think it is possible to make historical fiction. Um, this would be something that I would hold up there as the perfect example of how to write historical fiction, um, how to make it accessible to us today, but at the same time, keep it as true to the history as possible. And with that in mind, I'm going to go read some of her ancient Egyptian stuff, even though I'm not going to force any of the rest of you into that. Again, I will include in the email um, basically a short uh, bibliography of all of these sites that I've used. Um, and I hope that you all don't hate this book as much as I loved the book. Thank you. Sorry to miss you all on Monday night. <laughs>